and I believe it is. Proverbs 14 and verse 28, there is, a, there is a passage of scripture that shocked me when I came across it. Shocked me and scared me all at the same time. Because we don't realize how necessary growth is biblically not only from an individual standpoint, personal standpoint, but also from a ministry standpoint. And this passage of scripture shocked me when I saw it. Proverbs 14 and 28, and I'm reading from the authorized translation. When you find it, say, I have it. It says, in the multitude of people is the king's honor, but in the want of people is the destruction of the prince. Some translations will say in the, the lack of people. The lack, another translation says in the lack of followers is the destruction of the prince. Once again, in the multitude of people is the king's honor. So there's a, there's a, a sense of influence when people are following an individual, when a thing is growing, when a thing is developing gives you a sense of influence, honor, influence. It also gives you a sense of impact. But when ain't nobody coming, it's destructive. It's destructive not to have a thing that's not growing because you ain't got resources. You don't have help. You don't have the ability to have the right influence. Churches that are developing in cities and, and, and people are coming. And, I, and, and let me tell you something. And I, this may take this however you want to. I, I, don't, I don't want to be the small storefront church. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Now, I, I know that that's where I came from, but that ain't where I want to stay. No, you know, just... Chalk it up, call it arrogance, say it's erudite. I don't care. You know, I, I, I like central, uh, uh, you know, air and not having a fan. I like chairs that lock and don't move every time. You understand what I'm saying? I like good sound system. I like. But, but where there's a lack of followers, it, it destroys um, vision. It destroys purpose. It destroys uh, promise. So my point here is, and you want to write this down, growth is necessary. I don't care how spiritual we are. Growth is necessary. It's almost mandated. When you look at this passage of scripture, you almost get scared. You come to find out that without this multitude of people is the, is the king's honor, but in the want of people is the destruction of the prince. Now, there are three things right off top that I think is, is necessary for our growth. And I want you to write these things down from ministry standpoints. Number one, we must define our assignment. We have to define our assignment. You're not going to grow doing somebody else's job. You have to know what your assignment is. One of the heavy, heaviest things for us in this city is finding out that our assignment is totally different from other churches in this city. Like there are churches that their whole thing is to just teach and you sit down and you take notes. There is no jumping. There is no praise. There is no, you know, it's none of that. The vast majority of, of, of my, my ministering, I'm going to start out the first 25, 30 minutes just talking. Just like this. Sometimes kind of lecture. And somehow, some way, in the middle of me talking, the Holy Ghost going to hit. And before we know it, we running and flipping over, you know, chairs and standing on top of tables. Just the way it is. One of the worst things that I tried to do when we first started this church was I tried to take the assignment of someone else and build our church off of it. And you try to take somebody else's assignment, you have no anointing. It's like you lose your anointing when you try to take on somebody else's assignment. Are you understand what I'm saying? We have to define our assignment if we are going to grow. 
Is that okay so far? Yeah. All right. So the second thing is that we have to do after defining our assignment, we're going to have to define our audience. Amen. Amen. That's good. Yes, sir. The vast majority of people that come to my church were people that came straight out the club. So, um, you know, I, I can't use as many big words. I, I, I would come in and say things like, you know, um, um, well, I didn't say it all kind of stuff around here. Yeah, yeah, like I said one time during a message, you know, you had the unmitigated gall. And I'll never forget somebody came to me after the service with a notepad and asked me to give a definition of unmitigated and gall. <laughs> you have to know your audience. We have a multicultural audience in our church. So there's certain things I can say, certain things I can't say. White folks uh, 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 adhere to a certain thing in a certain way. Black folks adhere to a certain thing in a certain way. You have to know your audience, who you're drawn to, who you're connected to. If you're, if you're going uh, to minister to professionals where you can't come with a, a street lingo mentality, you lose them. Are y'all with me so far? I don't think quite oftentimes when we start churches that we, that we study our target audience. Exactly. Like if we're going to market towards someone, we need to know what audience we're marketing towards. Right. Are we going towards family? Are we a family church? Are we, are we a young church? Are we a youthful church? Are we a radical church? Are we an old church? What, are we, what, what type of church are we? And if we define that first, our assignment, then we'll know what audience we're going after. Okay, like take for instance, Matthew chapter 10 is a perfect example of this. Jesus told the disciples to go after a specific audience. Am I correct? He said, you go off to, after the lost, what? Of who? And that's, who, that's your audience. So your anointing is going to work, watch this now, on that specific audience. Are you understand what I'm saying? So a lot of times we're frustrated because we are preaching to the wrong people. People ain't getting us because we're preaching to the wrong folk. Are you understand what I'm saying? Anytime I start preaching to people that have destiny on the inside of them and it's something to pull out from them and they've gone through a whole lot, but it's like they need to be infused with hope, man, I become alive. But when I start preaching to people that feel like they already got it, they already on a level, they don't need nothing else, man, it pisses me off. Can I say pissed off here? I mean, I got the mic, you know. It, it does. It, 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 it frustrates me. It's like my, my gift don't work in certain environments. While I'm speaking on that, you, you also understand that the anointing is based on receptivity. Right? Because when Jesus told him, he said, if you go into a certain house and they don't receive you, you shake the dust off your feet. In other words, that ain't your audience. Y'all feeling what I'm saying? So you don't keep preaching to folk that ain't listening to you. Right? That wears you out. You, 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 you're killing your assignment on the wrong audience. Right? And then the, then the third thing I think is going to be necessary is that we must define our abilities. Number one, we must define our assignment. Number two, we must define our audience. And number three, we must define our abilities. Now, um, your abilities, okay, like take for instance, if you, if you are, if, if you're under a teacher, teacher's going to teach. That's right. It doesn't make sense to make a teacher become a hooper. If the best of your ability is that you're strong in administration, if a, if a preacher is strong in administration, but not strong from a, from a preaching standpoint, you can't make that preacher get away from, from that manuscript.